Right, should we uh, kick off proceedings? Uh, welcome all and thank you very much once again for joining us on our latest online conference in which uh, Michael will be going through his going through the, the themes in his latest book, Capital Wars. Um, so over to you, Michael. Good. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. What I'd like to speak about for the next uh, hour is um, this book, Capital Wars, which has recently been published by Palgrave Macmillan. Uh, I'm going to talk for about maybe 30, 40 minutes uh, on some slides which summarise the main themes and then open it up to questions that anyone may have. Capital Wars was largely written uh, last summer. Uh, I finished writing it in the fall of last year, clearly before the coronavirus crisis. But it's based on trends that will be accelerated by the crisis. Essentially, the US is not just weaponizing the US dollar, it's weaponizing US capital. We are, I think, in a Cold War II. Cold War I was about the military containment of the Soviet Union. This is about the economic containment of China. The recent extension of US dollar swap lines, so the group, which let's call that the S15 group of countries, is the economic equivalent of NATO. It is going beyond existing supranational organizations such as the IMF. Uh, it basically is a grouping, a club, that America is willing to uh, provide financing and key dollar financing for. That extended group goes beyond the Eurozone, the Bank of England, the Swiss National Bank, the Bank of Japan, to extend to outer reaches of US allies such as Australia, such as New Zealand, such as Brazil, Mexico, Singapore, etc. It patently excludes China, it excludes Russia, it obviously excludes Iran. Interestingly, India is not in the grouping, neither is Thailand. Those may be later entrants. But effectively, this S15 group is critical to understanding how the world is moving. Let's see whether China opens up an equivalent Warsaw Pact grouping, uh, which basically allows them to create an economic club rather like uh, this, uh, this S15 grouping for the, uh, for the Asian or China ally group, uh, something a little bit like uh, Comic-Con uh, that the Soviet Union basically funded. The book connects two real, two things. One is global liquidity, which is a subject very dear to my heart that I've been looking at for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, and it also looks at the rise of China. It concludes that the clash between the two result in capital wars, it will result in the internationalization of the Yuan, and it will result in the greater financialization of China. Now let me turn to some slides and try and um, go through these themes in terms of this presentation. In terms of the main themes of the book, which I've outlined on the slide in front of you, essentially what we're looking at is a definition of liquidity, which is rather different from the conventional definitions that people uh, align with in terms of money supply. Liquidity is a balance sheet concept. It's all about the quality theory of money, as I call it. And it basically is critical because it funds capital flows, it funds economic strength, and it's based increasingly on collateral. And that's a key, key point in understanding the cycles and the future growth. In terms of the themes of the book, there are really four or five that I just want to highlight. And the starting point has to be uh, what's happening in China and the former Soviet bloc with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, Deng's reforms in China starting from about 1985, China's WTO entry in 2001. That was a major change in the world economy. It effectively economically enfranchised about two to three billion new producers in the world economy and it reversed the polarity of world finance. It involved a significant productivity catch-up 
by China vis-a-vis -vis the West and particularly the US. And one of the things that I will argue is that that led to real exchange rate adjustment. Now I'll go into that in a few moments, but effectively what that means is that you, what you need to see to adjust the world economy to this new equilibrium is a long-term rise in the yuan currency and a decline in the US dollar. Now the problem is that the adjustment mechanism is not smooth and the adjustment mechanism is being forced mainly through forex markets but particularly through asset markets and that that is because globalization has made normal prices in the high street or labor costs very sticky so you've got a very asymmetric adjustment process essentially the key to understanding this is the u.s de demands stable to higher asset values because it's a financially dominated economy in other words people have uh, spoken before about concepts like the Greenspan put, which supports Wall Street. But China and emerging markets really need stable currencies, particularly against the US dollar. And the result of all The whole idea is that as these changes begun, have come to the fore, effectively the polarity of global finance has been reversed, which means it's increasingly difficult to understand what's going on. Already what you're seeing is a shift of capital going towards the east. And one of the points that I'll demonstrate in a moment, that even in countries like Germany, you've seen a dramatic reallocation of capital from the west towards the east. And that's one of the factors that is being driven by this magnet of Chinese, rapid Chinese economic development. You've effectively seen a collapse in the return on capital in the West at the margin, but a growth rate in the average return on capital as industries in the West who can't, uh, who can't create profitable new production have to basically cut their costs and try and uh, increase their profitability on existing capital. That has driven up cash flows, and those cash flows have gone into financial markets rather than new investment. And that's one of the factors that's leading to this greater global liquidity cycle. One of the other costs of all this is that this whole process is causing uh, greater increases in debt. We've got $300 trillion of global debt in the world economy right now. And one of the key things which many economists don't seem to understand is that debt needs to be refinanced. Therefore, it's not the cost of capital, the interest rate, which is so important in this framework. It's much more the capacity of capital uh, rather than the cost of capital. In other words, it's balance sheet capacity. And that's where liquidity is important, but liquidity needs safe assets and collateral. And that's where we've got a shortage because effectively China and the emerging markets are grabbing more and more of those safe assets. So essentially what we're seeing is a process whereby the world economy is becoming more and more unstable. We're breaking down, the barriers are breaking down, and what we're seeing is capital at war. As I've said, America is trying to weaponize the dollar, but increasingly China is basically facing up to that threat. Now, if you look at this next slide, what it basically says is that what are the conditions for a key world currency? Uh, I put in brackets seniorage because seniorage is one of the factors that is the gain, the economic gain from having your currency used as the international standard of value. Now, what I've tried to show in this uh, table at the bottom, underneath the quote from uh, Barry Eichengreen, uh, an American professor of says is that the dollar and the Chinese yuan, columns one and two, are nearest to being an international currency. The criteria for international currency is economic size, fiscal stability, financial liquidity, in other words, depth of financial markets, and military and diplomatic power, in other words, geopolitical strength. And what you see in terms of the ticks or the crosses is that the US pretty much fulfills all of those criteria right now. There is a growing question mark over the fiscal stability of the US, 
particularly coming out of this coronavirus crisis. China has fiscal stability. It's clearly got economic size. It does not have financial liquidity, and that is the key missing part of the jigsaw in China. And there is a question mark over its ability to escalate military power right now. That will likely change given the investment that China is making in its military. As regards the euro and the yen, you can see that they're not really on the same page. They're, they're not even contenders in this world for a key currency. Now, the worrying dimension in this is that China understands these factors. And what I've tried to show here is that in this quote by uh, Kua Liang, uh, who's a major general in the People's Liberation Army, uh, and often a spokesman for geopolitical uh, trends in China, what he's very clearly saying there is that the desire is to make the Chinese yuan or renminbi the primary currency of Asia. And that is, a co that is direct competition against the US. And part of the mechanism of that strategy is the one belt, one road strategy, which might, may align with what I was alluding to earlier on as the Chinese equivalent of Comic-Con that the Soviets had uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. Effectively, China is trying to get supremacy to challenge the dollar by controlling international flows of liquidity and capital. She already dominates world industry, but she now needs to build up her financial muscle significantly. And that is the challenge we need to look at. At the moment, you can see from this slide that China's financial muscle is actually a lot less uh, than might appear at first sight. Uh, the chart looks at various criteria, uh, size of central bank, the size of commercial banking system compared with the US, size of shadow banks, the liquidity pool, GDP, uh, GDP at purchasing power parity, etc. The stark gap there is between the level of financial assets in the US economy and that in China. China needs to balance this uh, or to, to achieve more of a balance against the US by increasingly financializing her economy, which basically needs uh, China to internationalize the yuan quite rapidly. Now, to come back to the themes that to, uh, to address here, some of the themes that are, that are talked about in the Capital Wars book, one of them is to look at the economic might of China and how it's affected the West on the left-hand graph, which is showing the impact that China's presence has had uh, take of this as being the signal being the fall of the Berlin Wall generically. But effectively what happened is that this was a huge productivity shock to the West. And what happened was that two to three billion new producers were economically enfranchised. Now what you can see there is the red line at the top on the left is China's marginal return on capital, what they get from investing in, in, in new plants and equipment, and the equivalent data for Germany as representative of Europe and the US. And you can see that China's downtrend is dominating what's happening in the Western economies, and it's likely driving returns on capital lower. Now, the result of that is shown on the right-hand slide, where you can see the difference between what I've called the average return on capital, which is basically what companies report in their balance sheets and their P&L statements, and the marginal return on capital, which is what economists look at. And there is a growing divergence between those two trends. The marginal return on capital, the profitability of new investment in the West is coming down, whereas the average return on capital has been basically trending upwards. And that's been because of cost restructuring in Western industry and effectively trying to run your existing capital more efficiently. What that does is it generates huge cash flows which go into financial markets and drive global liquidity and drive the global liquidity cycle but it's not really helping economic activity. One of the corollaries of this, which is actually a, a, a fascinating set of data that is published by the Bundesbank, is the location of German capital. This is real capital investment in plant equipment, etc. And what it shows is how Germany already has addressed these problems. Now, this must be a worrying dimension for the Eurozone because what it shows is Germany's focus uh, is very much on Eastern Europe and the East in general, Eastern Europe and Russia. And what the slide basically shows is the location of German FDI 
uh, in year 2000 and year 2018, the latest data. What it very clearly shows is a shift of capital of about 15 percentage points from the west to the east. Effectively, the US, if you look at the numbers, has lost out, um, and Russia and Eastern Europe and areas such as China have gained significantly. This shift of capital is critical, and it's one of the dimensions of, or one of, the dimensions of this entire capital war story. Uh, it would suggest that the Eurozone is basically under pressure or strain because Germany is effectively taking uh, liquidity effectively reallocating into Eastern Europe and Russia. The problem for the world economy and the reason that you're getting uh, financial problems all the time is demonstrated in these charts here which are looking at the accumulation of debt. And what they're really highlighting is the vast accumulation of debt that we've seen, not just over the, uh, the last 25 years, but actually more particularly in the last decade. And in particular, if you focus on the corporations uh, area on the left hand chart, you can see there how corporate debt has just skyrocketed after the financial crises uh, at, let's say, circa 2010. Uh, debt is really still growing very fast. Now, the key point in all this is that not only is this being driven by the China effect, China is causing Western industry to accumulate more debt because it, uh, it, it simply can't survive without taking it. But also the policies that Western governments are following, the austerity policies and the low interest rate policies are further encouraging this debt. Now, the key point about this whole problem is, and why it links in with liquidity, is that debt needs to be refinanced. As I said at the beginning, if you've got $300 trillion of debt in the world economy, and the average lifetime of that debt is five years, you need to roll over a whopping 60 trillion every year. Now that's coming clearly on top of what is now huge government uh, debt issuance as a result of the coronavirus crisis. And so what we're seeing is financial markets being strained. To roll over debt, you need balance sheet, and balance sheet is liquidity. Therefore, liquidity needs to expand. But liquidity is collateral based. And therefore, we need more and more safe assets to do that. And that's one of the challenges. You can see on the slide here that I've shown on the left hand, on the left hand side of the page, the supply of global safe assets split between um, the US and non-US sources. And the key point, the irony or paradox that we've seen since the global financial crisis in 2007-8 is a supply of safe assets that are needed to grow liquidity have just collapsed. They're clearly rising again now at the margin, but there's a lot of demands now on that pool. And so one of the results you see, the staring anomaly in the world economy on world financial markets that macro pre-regulators just seem to brush over and ignore is the chart on the right-hand side. And that is that the term premium, which is a slightly wonkish concept, but it's the risk premium on government bonds has collapsed into negative territory. Now, any academic or any uh, finance text that would tell you that's impossible. You don't get negative term premium on the safest assets in the world. And this is on the 10-year treasury bond, which is the canonical safe asset in the world economy. Why is that term premium negative almost 150 basis points? That's what the regulators and policymakers need to address. And they're simply not on this page. Now, let me come back to the mechanism of global liquidity and what's going on. And effectively, what I said at the outset is that real exchange rates need to adjust. Now, I've called this mechanism the Gresham Hume mechanism because it basically comes back to classical economics. Uh, it's the Hume species flow mechanism um, brought up to date with capital flows and including the Gresham, uh, you know, Gresham law point that uh, bad money drives out good. Effectively, what you see, and it's important to understand this mechanism for uh, how the book unfolds, is that essentially a liquidity shock, call it the China shock, if you like, affects the private sector uh, in the West. That leads to an adjustment which either comes through the end rate or it comes through asset markets. High street prices and wages are sticky under globalization. They don't change. 
Most of the adjustment is forced through those middle two boxes. Now, in terms of what the US faces, is that the US doesn't want its asset prices to collapse. In other words, a real exchange rate fall for America means either the nominal or market value of the dollar drops or US asset prices have to fall. The US doesn't want asset prices to fall because it's a financially based economy and collateral is critical to the credit mechanism. So what they do is they force adjustment through the dollar and that adjustment is forced by uh, a constant or a persistent loose US monetary stance. So the US central bank on the right is injecting more and more liquidity into US financial markets. That clearly causes bubbles. Now, if you're China and you're seeing an equivalent or symmetric uh, process, your private sector responding to that shock should be seeing either rising asset prices and or a rising nominal exchange rate. But China and emerging markets don't want um, to see their currencies higher. So they copy the US monetary easing and they create asset bubbles. So what you're seeing in the world economy is this persistent monetary boost by central banks. Now, the chart on the right is looking at the long term real trade weighted exchange rate for the US dollar using BIS uh, data. And what I've tried to show is that there is a downward trend in that line, but you see periodic spikes. And those periodic spikes make the adjustment process even more difficult because you're effectively in a headwind of a harder. And I'm not going to go into what those spikes meant, but effectively we're seeing one right now, uh, which has been caused by uh, re-regulation, tighter regulation after uh, global financial uh, crisis one. So here we have global liquidity. It's a footloose pool of $130 trillion or so. It's about one and two thirds times bigger than world GDP. Uh, it's fast moving and it's something which is disrupting uh, world financial markets. It's really driving the whole process of asset bubbles and it comes back to that original mechanism. If we look at the scale of global liquidity, these two charts are trying to identify the size of the pool and how rapidly it's grown and who are the major players. Now, what you can probably discern from the left-hand graph is that there are, broadly speaking, three major players here. Uh, one is very clearly the US, uh, one is the Eurozone, and the third, which is coming up fast, is China. And I've highlighted those three on the right-hand graph uh, with single lines so they stand out more clearly. Uh, the Eurozone has sort of had its you know, day in the sun in, in, in many regards. It's flatlining, it's got huge banking problems. Those banking problems are not gonna go away. Its ability to create liquidity is compromised. Um, and I think you can even see that through the struggles that have gone on uh, and the dithering through this financial crisis. The two powerful players are China and the US. China is in red, the US is in, uh, in orange. Uh, China has surpassed the US now in terms of the pool of its domestic liquidity. In other words, yuan-based liquidity is growing at, a, at an awesome pace. Uh, it's leveled off recently, but the ability for China to grow and manage that is very much there. So you've got two big players in the world economy. You can see that on the following slide, which is basically looking at who are the big central banks. And I've kind of alluded to this already, but the big players in this equation are the People's Bank of China and the Federal Reserve. And that's important for the liquidity generation mechanism. Now, the slide in front of you may be slightly wonkish, but it's absolutely critical to understand how the liquidity mechanism works and why we get financial cycles in the way that we do. And what you can see on the left-hand graph is a pyramid, an inverted pyramid, which demonstrates the hierarchy of global liquidity. What this basically says that in the, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, of the, of the inverted apex, you've effectively got the central banks and the safe asset pool. What I've called here high-powered money, which basically uh, is a summation of the monetary base uh, wholesale markets, and the pool of collateral. 
And those are the really the key factors that I want to concentrate. what the central banks do. It's the private sector leveraging up uh, instruments like US Treasury bonds and borrowing on the basis of that collateral worth. The offshore wholesale markets are pools of money rather like the, well in fact they are the euro dollar markets and that is a further way of actually generating liquidity because that's outside of central bank control. Now what the graph on the right hand side is showing is the breakdown of the traditional mechanism of credit creation which is the blue line which is the money multiplier you read about in economic textbooks uh which is basically a, a nice construction but really a fiction in the modern world what the world doesn't work like this anymore uh you've seen a collapse in this money multiplier uh principally through the uh period around the time of gfc1 global financial crisis in 2007-8 and what you can see on the other two lines, particularly the orange line at the bottom, which is a broad collateral multiplier, is what is driving global liquidity is basically uh, this high powered money block that I referred to on the, on the left hand graph. This is a collateral multiplier based on that, which is all these different elements there. This is what's driving global liquidity. What you've got is a multiplier of around about six times uh, for this, for this, uh, for this, uh, for this um, multiplier. Uh, so every time you increase collateral, global liquidity increases. If we explore this a little bit, in a little bit more detail, let me just highlight a couple of aspects. One is the growth of shadow banking, which um, you know, despite the fact that it's not in the headlines, is definitely there. Whereas uh, if you looked at shadow banking in two thousand and eight, it would have focused on the repo. And particularly the repo of mortgage-backed securities. Uh, the key instrument in the shadow banking world now is, is FX swaps. Uh, and that's a type of repo that's effectively a cross-border repo, but it's, uh, it's using, uh, for, it, using sort of local currency borrowing uh, in the FX market as collateral, and then borrowing largely dollars against that. Uh, and that's been a big, big driver of global liquidity recently. The chart on the right hand side is trying to illustrate how the world has changed. And one of the changes is the role of money markets as a vehicle for, for credit creation rather than banks. Uh, if we drew that diagram 20 years ago, banks would be at the center. Now it's the wholesale money markets. And the key difference is the top right hand area, which is what I call corporate and institutional cash pools. These are things like corporate treasuries, going back to the point that uh, Corporations in the West have been uh, basically benefiting hugely from cost restructuring. Those corporate treasuries are, are flush with cash. And asset managers in the West are getting a lot of cash flow as populations age. Hedge funds are also are big cash recipients. Forex reserve managers, particularly in the wake of the Asian crisis in 1997-98, have built up huge um, pools of Forex reserves, which need to be invested. And then you've got again uh, a cash collateral business. Now, what those, what that corporate institutional cash pools really need are safe assets. And they are the source of a lot of this collateral and, uh, and activity in the wholesale markets. And they're really driving this whole process. These new players in the market are big demanders of safe assets. And that's why the world has changed, and that's why regulators and policymakers need to understand uh, these new vehicles. They've grown up in the wake of China's rise, and in particular, the uh, let's say the progressive deindustrialization of the West and the growth of financial power. Now, on the cross-border markets, let me turn to that. If you look at the left-hand chart, it would seem at first sight that the US dollar is dominant, and that's pretty clear. What we show here is that the role of the US dollar in various areas like international debt issuance, international lending, forex market turnover, global payment systems, forex reserves. Dollar unquestionably uh, beats all, all comers hands down. The euro is there. The euro is, uh, is I think, an unrepresentative block because that, largely, those, that data is largely intra-eurozone. And since the Eurozone 
2010-2012 banking crisis, uh, non-euro area uh, economies have actually decreased their use of the euro. The renminbi of Chinese yuan is barely scratching the surface and the yen is out there on the right, not really uh, sort of troubling the scorer. But the renminbi is rising fast and that's one of the things I want to turn to. Just before I do, the chart on the right hand side of that page is illustrating one of the hidden facts in the cross-border markets. And that is the difference between gross and net flows. Economists, particularly if you start looking at, at current account imbalances, are missing the elephant in the room. Um, net flows, the current account imbalances, are those sort of very pale brown bars that you can barely see uh, towards the bottom of the axis. The solid brown bars that are sort of skyrocketing alongside, uh, like skyscrapers, those are, are the size of gross flows. They're massively bigger uh, than net flows, and that's really what matters in the cross-border market. Uh, and you can see what happened in 2007-8 uh, when you saw these, this big increase in balance sheet, in, in other words, the international balance sheet. Now, let me just turn to one of the key issues in understanding how this cross, these cross-border flows affect emerging markets and particularly capital flows. The left-hand chart is a very good heads up as to why emerging market investment is highly cyclical, but why it's also very predictable and why you can use this information to make a lot of money out of the emerging market. Very clear cycles. The monetary base, which is the orange line, uh, is moving in tandem alongside with changes in foreign exchange reserves. In other words, the policy mix of emerging market economies means that what they do is they monetize forex reserve changes. In other words, they monetize inflows from current accounts and from capital accounts. So if capital comes into those economies, they simply monetize it and expand their domestic liquidity and credit, causing domestic asset bubbles. So these cycles are very much the risk on risk off moves within emerging market economies. And they're tied up very closely with these capital flow movements. Now, the intriguing point, which is uh, shown on uh, the right hand page, is looking at these cross border flows to emerging markets as an index alongside uh, our own cross border capitals index of Chinese liquidity. Now, the remarkable fact is that those two cycles align really closely. And what I suspect is going on here is that the tempo of the Chinese economy is, is a magnet for capital flows into the region. So when you start to see the Chinese economy uh, moving at a low ebb, what you see is capital falling away into uh, emerging markets. As the Chinese economy revs up, it becomes a magnet and capital moves into the emerging markets. Now that's clearly, uh, I think, a very important point looking forward in terms of what, the ch what China is doing and how it uh, starts to move its economy. Now, what is important in China is liquidity. The whole system runs on liquidity. And at the heart of the system uh, is the People's Bank of China, which controls measured in, uh, in uh, billions of yen, of, sorry, of yuan. Um, and what this is basically showing is the huge expansion that you've seen in various types of, uh, of credit. Shadow banking in China is around one third of total Chinese credit. Rather un unlike other economies, China's shadow banking is really part of the existing uh, mainstream banking uh, organizations. They're just almost off balance sheet companies. Um, and they tend to be highly cyclical, very highly pro cyclical. But the point about this is that who controls the overall mix? And the overall mix is controlled very clearly by the People's Bank of China. Now, the data on the right hand chart, which I'll turn to first, is looking at the liquidity or credit multiplier for various economies worldwide, paralleling a chart I showed earlier on uh, for the overall credit multiplier for the world economy. What you can see here is what's happened to the credit multiplier, a traditional credit multiplier, in various economies over time. Uh, Japan has seen a progressive slide in its ability to create credit. In other words, the size of the central bank balance sheet expands, but you get no kicker in terms of 
uh, of broad liquidity growth. Uh, in other words, that's collapsed from levels of about 15 times to barely two or three. Similar processes have occurred in the US and in the Eurozone, where you've seen their credit multipliers collapse too. But just look at the stability of the Chinese system. It's absolutely remarkable. It's almost a straight line. What's more laterally, it's been increasing. So what that's saying is that who has real control here is the People's Bank of China. And the People's Bank of China is the linchpin of the whole system in China. That's what's driving the economy. So what we've got to do is to look at the People's Bank really closely. PBOC watching is going to become a new science. What you can see on the left-hand chart is the Chinese People's Bank's balance sheet. And without going into great detail at this right now, what I want to say is to highlight two things. One is that the black area on that chart represents Chinese foreign exchange reserves, money coming in to China from the current account surplus or from capital inflows, net capital inflows. That primarily up to 2014, 2015 was the main driver of the People's Bank's balance sheet and of Chinese liquidity and by corollary of growth in the Chinese economy. So China absolutely was dependent on these capital inflows. What you've seen since 2014-15 is a flatlining of those foreign exchange reserves and an increase in the importance of domestic financial instruments, the orange line, in controlling uh, the monetary base of the Chinese financial system. In other words, but we need to understand their open market operations. When they start to pump in liquidity, the Chinese economic machine will step up and capital will start to move towards China. What you can see on my second point is what they've been doing latterly is they've been basically flatlining the balance sheet. They've been doing not very much. There has been a deliberate policy of trying not to uh, stimulate the economy over the last 18 months through the trade tensions with the US. Equally, they're not doing it right now. Uh, in Sherlock Holmes terms, this is the dog that didn't bark. Why isn't China stimulating its money markets right now when the rest of the world is? I think it's because they want a stable yuan and they want to come out of this crisis demonstrating that the yuan is a robust currency. Now, moving towards the final uh, couple of slides. What this chart here is trying to demonstrate is the fact that China is financially underdeveloped. Uh, and that really is a, is a key, key point. What you can see on the black line on the right-hand chart is gross private sector capital flows uh, on average for the world as a percent of GDP compared with China in orange. China has uh, a capital flow account that is woefully underdeveloped. And if you look at in detail at the pie charts on the left-hand slide, what it says is that China's gross flows are dominated by two things. One is FDI coming in, and that may well be changing, but traditionally it's been FDI coming in, and the other is banking flows. Well, that simply is the fact that any international corporation that wants to invest in China needs yuan, so they invest and the Chinese banks lend them, uh, lend them the money. So that's the main operation of Chinese, uh, the Chinese capital account. The current account is, uh, is a surplus which the uh, People's Bank via SAFE, the State uh, uh, Administration of Foreign Exchange, manages through China's foreign exchange reserves. And since we know that the current account has moved towards balance in China, foreign exchange reserve growth has leveled off uh, uh, alongside. But what China needs to do is to radically uh, change this mix in terms of its capital account. And it's doing that in a number of ways. It needs to internationalize the yuan and to financialize the economy. And this is the next important stage of Chinese development. One of the things it's doing is operating a Made in China 2025 policy, which is basically re-onshoring a lot of Chinese production. And that will basically help to sustain uh, a capital account, uh, sorry, a current account surplus over the coming years. Secondly, it needs to develop a trade credit market in Yuan. Uh, in other words, uh, more and more trade, China's trade, needs to be invoiced uh, in Yuan, both inputs oh, and both imports and exports. And it's very interesting to note that when the dollar in uh, from the 1920s onwards, the key factor was 
that more trade was, was invoiced in dollars and US banks began to develop a trade credit system. The third thing that China needs to do is to open up its bond market, particularly to regional investors, but more particularly for global investors. And that will start to see a widening out on those two small slices of the pie, which is basically equity and debt uh, purchases, uh, gross purchases. Uh, the Chinese bond market is big, it's high yielding, uh, it's been relatively stable, uh, it should be a haven for Western bond managers, uh, and that's another factor to open up. And the fourth point, which is happening as we speak, is the establishment of a digital yuan. In other words, uh, a cryptocurrency, if you like, managed by the Chinese state that will allow peer-to-peer -peer transfers without, financial, without the need for financial intermediaries. And that will be another factor that will effectively uh, help to internationalize the yuan, in this case, the, the, the digital yuan. So what we've got here is a picture whereby China is an industrial giant, but it's a financial pygmy. And that's what needs to change in terms of this coming capital war. So to summarize uh, what I've been saying, here are the key points. And broadly, uh, I think to sort of pick out a couple of those, what I'm really saying is, that you've got productivity catch up and real exchange rate adjustment, which is coloring the whole adjustment process in the world economy. That should mean the long term rise of the yuan and the decline of the US dollar in terms of value. But alongside what you should be seeing is similar uh, demarcations of capital. Uh, you should be seeing a, the Chinese uh, capital pool increasing and the US capital influence decreasing. And that's really what capital wars are about. America is weaponizing the US dollar and weaponizing US capital. And that's what I think some of the recent moves that we've seen, as I alluded to right at the beginning, with the development of this S15 group of swap line, uh, uh, swap line holders or, or beneficiaries uh, coming forward and this sort of informal economic NATO, which is, uh, which is starting up. So let me stop there. Um, and there's probably about 20 minutes or so for questions, and I could uh, happily take those right now. So let's see where we are. Right. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for that. Um, and uh, for questions, everyone, uh, if you would like to ask Michael a question, there should be a uh, chat button there. And if you would like to ask a question, then just post uh, in the chat. I believe that we already have uh, one from Tim Voke. So I will patch Tim Voke through if he can speak. Tim, you there? Can we? I don't think he's there. Uh, I can read out his question for him. Um, okay, go for it. Uh, a private survey in the US showed that 87% of respondents thought that China uh, should be held accountable for the pandemic. This was in the US Northeast, a democratic stronghold. Um, a democratic stronghold. If this is used as a key slogan for presidential election, how does it play out with China's holdings in US treasuries and the debt financing going forward? Okay, well, I think it's an interesting question because I think that very clearly with Trump under pressure for re-election, uh, he's got to do something. I think that uh, the obvious thing is to lash out towards China. And um, there will be, you know, uh, I think some escalation of this, uh, uh, of this between Biden and Trump uh, in terms of who can bash China the most. So I think that, you know, the, the, the hope of any sort of trade uh, agreement is probably diminishing fast. And what you're seeing is an escalation now. Uh, and as I sort of alluded to right at the beginning, uh, we, this is a Cold, a Cold War II in many ways, uh, fought out between China uh, and its associates and the US and its, its allies. Um, what does it mean in terms of, uh, uh, of the election? Uh, I, I don't know, I think it's probably difficult to predict, but broadly what we're seeing here is an escalation of these, uh, of these trends, um, if that helps to answer that question. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, next question we've got from James Hull. James, I will unmute you now. Over to you. you. Uh, hi. Um, so my question is, uh, would 
China be able to internationalize the UN without opening the capital account for its citizens to be able to move their own capital offshore? Well, the answer is it would be an ideal, uh, but it's possible. Um, in other words, what you need to do is to control that, uh, control those flows. I mean, you, you can think back to uh, the early years of the of the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, where uh, certainly capital account was not uh, uh, was was um, was not open or uh, was not convertible for some countries right up until the early 1980s. So. Uh, Throughout that period, up to the 1980s, the dollar was still sort of king. Um, so I think it's possible. It's less than ideal for China, but it can be done. And there are two ways they could do that. One is through uh, increasingly invoicing uh, its products or its inputs in yuan. Now it's doing that more and more, and we've seen, uh, you know, increasing evidence of that uh, both in the oil market uh, and in terms of investment. Uh, Chinese investment through the Belt and Road Initiative. So that, that's one of those factors. Uh, the other thing could be the use of a, of a digital yuan uh, within the Asian or, or Central Asian region. So I think it's possible. It's less than ideal, but it's certainly a key start. And the more that you get a division of the world between these two groupings of East, East and West, maybe the wrong way of putting it, between China's allies and uh, America's allies, the more you are likely to see uh, this the the role of the yuan increasing now one of the things that could happen I, I would suspect in this is that China has one great asset that many other uh, many other of its associates don't have and that is a pool of dollars so one of the things that you could see happening is particularly if the US is reluctant to share its dollars widely uh, with this group is for China to pool its dollars with others and use that as a reservoir uh, uh, for others to use. So in other words, what they do is they begin to substitute dollars within their forex reserves with yuan, and they fall back when necessary on this extended pool of dollars that China is controlling. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, we do have other questions. Next one we have from Andy Mill. Over to you, Andy. Andy, are you there? Sounds like not. There's, um, there's one here from Huizhiang, um, which is, as the US dollar falls in value, the PBOC asset side of the balance sheet where the US treasuries sit fall in value, which is a tightening of money supply. We see a repeat of 2015-2016, when the Chinese sterilized this by increasing the holdings of Chinese government debt on the assets side, increased uh, RMB, uh, RMB liabilities. Um, yes, let, let me say a little bit more about the, the, the issue about, um, uh, about treasuries and, um, uh, and what happens. Uh, Tim Voak, I know, asked uh, uh, that question, which I, I know I didn't address before, but effectively, I, I don't think that what you're gonna see is massive selling, a wave of selling of US treasuries, as some people have suggested. It's not in China's interest to do that. Uh, it's in their interest not to build up anymore. That's a different question. They won't add to their existing stockpiles and then they're not, clearly. They're using any capital inflow uh, or current account surplus to recycle into uh, the Asian, uh, the wider Asian region or Central Asian region through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and that's broadly how things are, I think, panning out. But in terms of the operation of the balance sheet, uh, what does all this mean, particularly if the dollar falls in value? Well, I think the obvious thing that they will do is use domestic assets uh, more intensively to offset that. And what you've seen very much since 2014, 2015 is a situation whereby uh, the Chinese have used domestic monetary operations to control domestic credit really for the first time ever. And so you're seeing the, de the development of an active central bank. Now, the development of an active central bank was critical in the establishment of the dollar in the immediate post-World World War I era. And I think one needs to think about how quickly these things can change. Uh, the US dollar, uh, sorry, the US economy surpassed the British economy uh, in around 1817 size. It surpassed the British economy in terms of export performance 
in 1913, uh, but still in the turn of, or the beginning of World War I, uh, the US dollar was, was quoted in fewer markets than the Austro-Hungarian krona. And that shows you the extent to which the dollar was not internationalized in 1914. However, by 1920, it was, and one of the routes out of that was the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913, which basically uh, enabled the US to have an elastic currency uh, for the first time. And that put, that put a lot of foreign investors into, uh, into the US. And that's another factor which is important. On top of that, as I've said, the US then began to, uh, to, uh, to, to try and denominate more and more goods in dollars, and there was a trade credit market uh, established in the US. And then when Britain came back to the gold standard in 1925, and this is a very important psychological point, uh, Britain came back at $4.86 per sterling. Now that's really important psychologically, because 10 years earlier, the dollar wasn't even on the same page. When they came back, they decided to quote, they decided to quote uh, the, British, the British pound against the US dollar, a rival currency. So one of the things I think we need to think about is when more and more investors start to quote uh, the key currency as being the US dollar yuan cross rate, we know that the dollar is suffering more and more of a challenge. Um, uh, will you see, I think part of the, the question as well was, will we see uh, a repeat of 2015, 2016? I think what's alluded to there in China is the big capital outflows, which were associated with dropping exchange controls and the anti-corruption drive of Xi Jinping. Um, I don't think that's going to happen again. I think those were lessons learned. So there'll be a very slow uh, ability to, to get capital out. And if that operates via a digital yuan, there's clearly much more control that the Chinese authorities could exercise on that. The whole tenor of China's economic and financial development is slowly, slowly. This is not, this is not rapid change. And equally, I think if you look at what the yuan is doing now, the whole policy is to keep the yuan as stable as possible. Stability is the key word. Thank you. More questions. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we've got one from Chris Mitchinson here. Over to you, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Um, just looking back on my now somewhat historic experience of Japan and the BOJ in the 70s and 80s, they had total control of the military system, with the guidance to banks, undervalued yen, but with the liberalization of the financial system and of the currency, currency they moved from being apparently competent to being totally incompetent. And I just wonder whether the big Bank of China is likely to suffer a similar fate. Um, it didn't take long for Japan to end uh, its reputation as a great growth economy to being one of the casualties of the world. Is that no. a China's fate? No, I think um, a, a critical question. My answer to that would be, would be basically uh, sort of threefold. Um, one is that, um, Japan went through a very similar exercise that China's going through now. There was a huge productivity catch-up. I mean, it, same thing happened to Germany as well. But that productivity catch-up required a rising real exchange rate. Now, to come back to the mechanism I spoke about earlier on, you can either do that through uh, a rising yen or, and or rising asset market prices. And basically what happened was that Japan's productivity jumped was so significant, they could really do both. So what you saw was a rising yen and you saw a, a rising asset markets. Now, the problem that Japan uh, in a way faced is that the rise in the yen was so significant through this period that it basically priced uh, Japanese producers uh, out of business, particularly period where uh, the financial market, the bubble collapsed in 1990, as we know. And that period of very, very strong yen effectively destroyed the, the Japanese economy. The Chinese have looked very closely at the, China, at the Japanese model, and they say wholeheartedly that they're not going to make these same mistakes. You know, we'll, we'll see, because it's very difficult to manage uh, these, these vast capital flows. But one of the things the Chinese patently don't want to do is to let the, the Chinese yuan appreciate massively, and that's why they've resisted this. 
So if you go back to history and you look at what happened at the time of the Leuven Plaza Records, there were agreements there to try and get the yen and at the same time the Deutsche Mark higher against the US dollar. Uh, we've seen attempts by the Americans to do that with the Chinese, but the Chinese authorities have, have maybe cleverly resisted that to, net, to date. Now, um, the corollary of that is it forces adjustment elsewhere. And that adjustment is being forced uh, on the onto the dollar and onto uh, Chinese financial markets. But the, the Chinese at the moment are resisting these, these trends. So there's a lot of pressure building up in the system. But I think that the way that it's relieved is that you start to get uh, the yuan rising progressively against the dollar. And we'll see if that's one of the things that comes out of this crisis. Now, the other factors that I think will, are important in Japan's case that are just worth mentioning, one is uh, in terms of the relative economic performance of China vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan. And although it's a very unfashionable and probably very unpopular analogy to draw, is that what you're seeing in China's case is an economic growth model that is not dissimilar to what happened in the case of the, of the Soviet Union. And a lot of, uh, uh, and I know that it would sort of send people into horrors to think about this, but it's actually not dissimilar in many ways. If you look at what happened in the case of the Soviet Union uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, is that many pundits were predicting year after year after year that the Soviet economy would fail and collapse, and it never did until it did. Uh, it basically took two decades or more uh, for, that, for that growth collapse to occur. And that may be the case in China right now. So a lot of people are saying we're not going to get this 6% growth continuing. It's going to collapse to a rate of 2 or 3% or whatever it may be. Now, aside from the problem this year, looking at the trend in China, it may well continue for a lot longer. And what we know is basically centrally planned economies or planned economies can grow and growing for much, much longer uh, than maybe people in the West using their models would suggest. So we could easily be seeing two decades or more of strong Chinese growth. And that may be inefficient growth, it may be unbalanced growth, but it, it's still growth. And that's one of the things that will clearly increase the economic might of uh, China. The third point is one about the internationalization of the yen. And that was something that was just not wanted in Japan's case. Uh, they, they, they shunned away from that. That may well have been under American direction, but there was certainly not uh, invoicing in yen, in yen, and there certainly wasn't the development of a yen money market where you get international participation. And these are the things that China desperately needs to do if it wants to internationalize the yuan. It's got to get these financial markets expanded. Uh, let me take some more questions. It's probably time for two or three more. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, we do have uh, one more from Lewis Gregory. Uh, over to you, Lewis. Um, yeah, to what extent does the, you know, the current, current Fed actions in terms of expansion or you know, deterioration in balance sheet you know, speed up this process, especially given you know, what the Fed's doing in you know, seriously monetary in nature? And you mentioned, obviously, that the PBOC is wanting um, you know, increasing invoicing of real economic activity for that yuan to um, gain prominence, if you like. I think it does. I think it's a very good question. I think what you what you've got is uh, is a long term uh, is a long term threat here because of the, the huge uh, monetization that's going on in the U.S. It looks as if uh, the Federal Reserve is prepared in latest statements to monetize about three quarters of the debt increase that the U.S. is is undertaking as a result of the of the coronavirus crisis. And I think the alacrity with which the U.S moved in terms of giving out swaps, swap dollar lines, uh, these swap lines to this group of, uh, of 15 countries, uh, the speed of that tells us they don't want the dollar to go up uh, because that would have been the, uh, the, uh, the, the pressure otherwise. So I think what we're seeing is a huge monetary expansion. And what history tells us is that monetary expansions basically lead to currency, ultimately currency devaluation. Now, I think that's what's going on right now. Uh, in sort of separate work, we've said, look, one of the benchmarks to look at, which may be an unbiased or less biased uh, benchmark than many others right now, is to compare the US dollar against the Swiss franc. And if you look at the Swiss franc US dollar cross, I think it's very clearly rolling over 
which is, I think, testimony to this huge monetization which is going on. So I would suggest that we're looking at a period where the, the dollar uh, may well consolidate its role in, uh, in the, those countries, those allies that use dollars, but the value of the dollar is likely going down. And that's not necessarily a bad thing for dollar usage and for the strength of the US economy ultimately coming out of this. Thank you. You guys have another couple of questions, Tom? Uh, yes, we do have, um, I think we, there's one I can see from James Hull. Yeah, James Hull, we have another one there. James, I will just patch you through again. One sec. Over to you, James. Hey, thanks for taking my question again. Um, so I guess, are there any constraints around debt or, or would, would it be relative? Like, uh, if every country is levering up together as opposed to some levering and some not, you know, notably uh, Yi Gang, you know, at the PBOC, he doesn't want to increase the debt levels in, within China's domestic economy. Uh, and that's even right now during this uh, CV-19 crisis, whereas other countries seem to be willing to increase debt. Yes, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good point. I mean, the, the, uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a, a, a one to ponder on. I think the, the, the whole issue with debt is in countries that that debt uh, is not productive, and so we we reach you know long term insolvency constraints, and that's one of the things that has obviously spooked a lot of investors and economists since the global financial crisis. But I would say the key thing in terms of debt is a more, more immediate problem of, of, of illiquidity. And that is that you need, the debt by its nature needs to be refinanced. And that's the dimension that's not really been fully understood. Why have we seen these repeating financial crises or liquidity crises over the course of the last decade or more? It's because there is so much debt to refinance and not enough balance sheet to refinance the debt. And so what you find is that when you get shocks hitting the world economy, where you need, uh, where investors need precautionary holdings of more dollars, that dollar pool is then shrunk and the ability, or the financing pool is shrunk, and the ability to use balance sheet to refinance debt is diminished, and hence you get a crisis. So I think that that's the, 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 the generic problem we face, and that's only gonna go away if private sector debt in particular is reduced, which means ending these austerity policies and probably getting interest rates up to a more normal level. In China's case, uh, it's, a, it's a slightly different problem. Most Chinese debt is state debt and state debt is, you know, I'm not gonna say meaningless, but it's, it's less meaningful than private sector debt uh, because it's, much more, it's easier to socialize that debt. And China has a very good record over time of financial repression in its economy, of spreading any, uh, of any burden widely over time. Uh, and that's what it's likely to do again. China is clearly uh, you know, about worried, but it's, it's concerned about debt. Uh, and as you say, Yi Gang is basically one of the advocates to say we don't want to take on more debt. I think the other thing to say is that they may not be as reckless, if that's the right word, that they were in 2008, 2009, of massive spending programs. But I would fully suspect that the Chinese want to demonstrate that their economy comes out of this COVID virus crisis in a stable and robust form, and it's a flag they can wave. And therefore, I would suspect that what you will see over the course of coming months is more and more fiscal stimulus and probably more uh, more intervention by the People's Bank. But ultimately, China wants to be seen here as the rock, both for its economy and for its currency. Tom, maybe we've got time for another, just maybe a final two questions? Yes, I think we have uh, one from Patrick Flynn. Um, just patch it through now, Patrick. Over to you. Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, could USD stay elevated, uh, keep steady, while the term premium stays negative? Well, that's uh, that's probably a uh, it's a sort of sixty-five four thousand dollar question. I mean, it's 
I mean, my my argument would be no. I don't think it can, uh, I, because I think the I think the issue is is that um, that the I think the term premium is under a lot of pressure, and typically when you see uh, periods of massive fiscal issuance and uh, massive central bank balance sheet expansion, as you saw or as you're seeing now, term premia tend to rise. Um, and that's because the amount of safe assets in the system uh, increases from uh, you know, zero to a, to a huge amount. And therefore, you don't need to, uh, the excess demand for safe assets falls away and consequently term premium will adjust. Now, if you look at what happened uh, in the period of supposed yield curve control in the US back in the early 1950s, what we saw there was a very different uh, situation, or sorry, I should say late 40s, early 50s. And in that period, what you saw was very successful US uh, yield curve control, where basically what happened was that um, uh, debt issuance in the US collapsed because of the war ended. So actually there was a net decline in the stock of treasuries. And secondly, the Federal Reserve balance sheet was very constrained. So it's very easy for the US to operate yield curve control there and to keep the term premium down. Uh, I think it's gonna be a lot more difficult now, not least because in 1945, banks, uh, US banks owned over 40% of the US treasury market. Today they own, they, uh, they own 5% and foreigners own over 40%. And so the, the balances are very different. So I would say, is that as you start to see pressure in the bond market, potentially bond losses, foreigners will be selling down their positions. And that's why I think that it's difficult for the dollar to stay up. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. And yeah, that's great. Thanks. There's uh, maybe one more question and we may have to close. Yes, uh, we do have uh, one more here from uh, Ki Zhang. Um, I'll just patch you through now, Ki. Over to you. Maybe you can read it out to him. Yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, uh, they say, uh, if there is a coordinated increase in high powered money via a massive increase in government def deficits, and if China yeah. doesn't ease in yeah. line, it might end up like Japan where it has too strong a currency, thereby resulting in exporters losing competitive competitiveness. Right. Okay. That's a uh, that's a, a very interesting point. Uh, whether I think that the 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 days of coordination um, uh, among the um, G10 or whatever the grouping is, is 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 now no more. I think there's there's very little coordination. It's effectively every you know every man for himself in terms of uh, of what's going on here, and we can see that very clearly in the response to the coronavirus crisis across the eurozone. Um, Will there be a coordinated, there'll be a collective increase in high power money. Uh, that's, that's for sure. It may not be an accord. Uh, the only accord I think we've got is the one that I alluded to, which is this S15 grouping of swap lines, dollar swap lines. Uh, but I think we are seeing, obviously, high power money increase. Uh, that's monetizing government deficits. And China patently isn't, isn't easing in line. And that's, that's the key thing. Now, could that mean, rather like Japan, that you start to see uh, an increase in the level of the yuan versus the dollar or a lack of competitiveness in time for the Chinese currency? It's possible, but I think that one of the things that China is trying to manage here is the level of the yuan. They don't want a rapid increase. They don't want uh, a Japan-like situation. And therefore, if you start to see upward pressure on the yuan, that will be the trigger for China to, to join in uh, this high powered money expansion and the People's Bank will come into action. And one of the things that, uh, you know, it's a, probably a, a dull past of mine every day to look at the People's Bank uh, website and basically to see what the Chinese People's Bank did in the markets. And every day you see a statement coming out, uh, pretty much every day, 90% of days in the last uh, six weeks, they say liquidity is adequate, uh, no need for any more open market operations. Uh, what a contrast to what's happening elsewhere. And this is saying that China is coming through this crisis in a much more stable way, or they're certainly, uh, they're certainly portraying it in a much more stable way. And that you know, opens up the way to saying that we're in a regime now 
of Cold War II, where it's America versus China. Uh, it's not this sort of uh, Chimerica concept that was popular two or three years ago. It's not a unified response. China and America are basically dividing and they are, have spheres of influence. Uh, the US is weaponizing the US dollar and US capital and China is challenging at the same time. And that's what's going to make financial markets interesting, uh, very interesting for the next few years. I thank you, everybody. I think we've come to the end of our hour. So thank you for your patience, perseverance. And I hope it was and the book thank is you. published now by Macmillan Palgrave. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I shall be sending a link out uh, for the book uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks once again for showing interest in this conference. And have a good rest of your days.